so our thanks to uh, George Bowie. Uh, as I say, we certainly got our money's worth with him, uh, with uh, lots of good chat from Newmarket, good chat about cachet, uh, the talking points as well. If you missed it earlier on, uh, we will, well, you'll be able to find it uh, on, the, on the website, but Rich Strike uh, at odds of 80 to 1. Uh, recorded an absolutely fairy tale success in the Kentucky Derby uh, in uh, the United States overnight. Uh, so that's one to uh, certainly have uh, a good look at. And we've talked about Mental Health Awareness Week, which is this coming week, uh, which is, again, something else. Re and Racing Welfare is part of that. Well worth Googling to find out what Racing Welfare are up to. And we've looked ahead as well to York. But now we're going to meet somebody I've never met before. Daniel Kubler is a trainer with his wife, Claire uh, in Upper Lambourne, and uh, he has joined us on the sofa this morning. And they're using all sorts of quite revolutionary um, uh, methods in terms of training their horses, which are, good morning, welcome. Morning. Uh, yeah, which are running really well, the horses. Yeah, no, we've had, we've had a really good week. Um, we had a nice, nice winner at Chester, a horse called Outgate, um, and he's quite exciting going forward. You know, we'll be looking for the something like the Britannia for him. Um, and then we had a, a nice winner at Nottingham on Friday night, Percy's lad. And um, That was the second win for that one, wasn't it? Yeah, second win, uh, second start for the yard. Um, he was a very sort of talented two-year-old, lost his way completely last year. Um, and we picked him up at the horses in training sale. Claire did a lot of work on an analysis and, and finding the right horse. And um, Sam Haggis as well helps us a little bit and, and feeds in some of his data and some of the things that he does. And, um, yeah, he's proved to be a really good buy. He's two from two, two very impressive wins. And... Um, could be talking about something like the Hunt Cup or we might drop him back to seven furlongs for the, the Buckingham Palace if, if that looked the better way to go. But, yeah. uh, and tell me about Sarsen Farm, where you train in Upper Lambourne. So, um, and it's a joint, you're a joint licence, yeah, aren't you? Yeah, joint licence. And Claire is nay Middlebrook, so your in-laws are Gary and Leslie L yeah, Middlebrook. Middlebrook. very successful breeders, um, owner breeders, and um, you know, they, they started out, they sent us a few of the lesser horses, and as we've gone on, they've helped us... Um, you know, they started to send us the better ones, and um, you know, we, we're starting. So even with family, they put their toe in the water. Yeah, just Gary, to check. Gary, Gary, Gary would always be. Um, you know, he, he he's he likes having his horses with good trainers, and he wanted us to prove ourselves. And, right. and now he's really got quite right. Us. Yeah. Quite right, and he's yeah. had some absolutely brilliant trainers mm -hmm. over the years. So Sarsen Farm itself. Yeah, so we built Sarsen Farm from scratch in the middle of Upper Lambourne. It was a very old, run-down farmyard, and we've redeveloped it into a sort of state-of-the-art yard. And um, I think we use a lot of science and scientific analysis in the way we approach that's what it. it that's my yeah that's going and, my next bit and the design was very much led by that you know we had a guy from from ireland from the irish equine center called alan Crichton come over and he um he looked at the designs to make sure the airflow is very good and things like that and then we also looked at things like it's quite a lot of research around what type of stables horses are happiest in and and different you know just like people some people like a very communal environment and other horses uh, other people prefer a slightly more enclosed space and there's some quite good research into um, optimum stable design for the welfare of horses and so we've got a variety of different types of boxes and layouts to, to keep different types of horses and we've got some nice turnout and things like that. And so how, many, how many horses? Uh, we, we train around 40 horses at the right. moment. So. Excellent. Now you've mentioned a whole lot of words that I want to pick you up on. <laughs> uh, analysis is uh, certainly one of them. Um, so you use a particularly analytical approach to training racehorses, that's a fair assessment. Yeah, um, I think you know fundamentally because you've got to you've got to use your eyes as well. You've, you've got, got to, to use be your eyes, people, yeah, yeah. But and and you've got to have analysis. you've got to have excellent riders. You know, we've got an outstanding team of riders, um, very good yard staff. You know, a lot of our staff been with us for quite a long time, and and you know they're critical. You know, our, our team of three guys who work on the yard doing the sort of mucking out and the grooming and those guys, they you know they've all been with us four, five, six years, and and you know they really know the horses inside out and. That feedback's critical, but what we can then do is put a layer of analysis. So you do that over side of it, of it, the horse person. Yeah, bit exactly. Plus, plus, exactly, yeah. and then the two in combination to give you the, you know, the really high quality feedback to make sure that you're, you know, you're getting absolutely best out of each individual horse, and you're designing a training program and a, you know, a sort of regime and you know does this is this horse happier being turned out in the afternoons or or does this horse actually get quite wound up out in the paddocks and it's not it's not really for them and so it's like dealing with well it is it is the same as dealing with people yeah exactly you know everyone has their preferences and you know we try and manage our staff and, and create a great working environment and you know if you've got happy people we've got happy horses um, and uh, uh, funny enough I, I i saw when you started training you said you're always looking around for ideas so was this because you're your now wife, who was then your fiancée, I think, um, she, she comes from a sort of scientific background, doesn't she? So it was that 
did did she sort of um, did she bring that to the party, so to speak? Yeah, and I think both of us naturally, you know, you know, we 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 sort of have a similar ethos to life. And um, Claire Claire studied uh, natural sciences at Cambridge and specialised in physiology, so obviously she's got a massive understanding of you know on on that in depth level of, of kind of a lot of the science that goes on. I did a degree in equine agricultural business management that had a big chunk of equine science in it, and my family sort of is quite a medical family. I've got brothers who are doctors, and, and you know, there's that sort of scientific questioning things. And, and coming to racing from outside, I would look at a lot of things that happened, and, and you sometimes think, well, why, do, why, why is that done that way? And, you know, when you then sort of look at it and think about it critically, you can see that there's a scientific process that leads to that. And then there's other times you think, well, actually, the science would say that doing it this way is this way's better. And you're always looking... So you've got to sort the wheat from the chaff, Yeah, so and I think, you know, it's, it's that concept of marginal gains in sport. Yeah. You're always looking for that little edge to make a small difference. And if you can bring lots of them together, you, you, can, you can out-compete your, you know, your rivals. Well, let's, let's get some examples then. Yeah. Um, so I'm told, ask you about, I was told by somebody, ask you about the speed gene. So, yeah. Um, so just tell us, first of all, what a speed gene is. So, well, is it obvious what it is? N- not necessarily. Um, so um, we have different muscle types, and the greater the proportion of fast twitch to slow twitch um, essentially decides which distance is the best distance to run over for a horse, and all that's c- uh, coded for by, by the genes that you have, which don't change. So we can take a blood test from a horse, and we can look, and we can then define, and I think there's a graphic up now yeah. explaining them, and... Um, you know, you get one set of genes from your your father, and then the other set from your mother, and um, those then combine, and, and you can have end up with one of three results, depending on what you inherit from your parents, and um, that then helps us work out. Okay, so when we get a horse into training, we'll do that test, and we'll say, okay, well, this is, you know, according to this gene test, is going to be roughly a stayer, a sprinter, or a sort of you know mile a middle distance type of horse, um, and so we'll train it, and also. The CC sprint types, they tend to be more precocious types. So we're just looking at the, what, what the graphic here. So yeah. the CC is the, ends up in sprint races. Yeah, those are, you know, and all of these things are percentages. The majority will end right. up doing that because there's other factors that play in. You know, you can have a TT horse, but actually its mentality is such that it won't relax, it won't settle to, to be a good stayer. So then to optimise that horse's performance, you have to make a compromise. So, so it's a classic example of the data is there, yeah. but you've still got to interpret the data. You've still got to interpret and the data. And whatever walk of life we're in, you've still got to work out what it means. Exactly. And you've got to watch that horse and you've got to work with it. And you might spend, with a CC horse, if it's quite keen and, and it, you'd be less worried than with a TT horse early in its training, you'd be thinking, okay, this horse is going to be optimal to be a stayer, so we've really got to work on getting this horse to settle, whereas if it's going to be obviously a five furlong sprinter, we probably have to worry slightly less about that and we can look at other aspects of its training. And just in terms of, you know, to, to, to discover what's what and wh- which horse is which, yeah. what's the process involved uh, there? So that's, uh, that's simply a blood test. It's, right, simple and, as that. Yeah, and they go off to, they go off to Ireland and they get analysed over there and they do lots of other more detailed tests and, and you know, you can use those for, for slightly different things and, and you know, they're, they're starting to predict p- potentially the, the ath- athletic ability of a horse and, and things like that by looking at the various gene combinations that there are. Um, this is probably the most simple, mm. simple and, uh, one. You mentioned Ireland. Am I right in saying Jim Bolger is a bit, yeah, who's exactly. really interested in all this? Yeah, I mean, Jim Bolger effectively set this company up that we use together with a scientist called Emmeline Hill who was working at Dublin University at the time and, you know, they, they did the basic ground research developed the company, created the company, and then, um, you know, essentially made a commercial product that's available to, to anyone. So a horse comes to your yard. Do, is that practically the first thing you, you do to, to sort of work out? Well, what... the first thing you do is you look at the horse and you sort of see the horse, and then once you've kind of checked the phys- physical, you know, are there any physical issues we need to deal with, and, and once we've got it in training and, and once we've kind of started to learn a bit about the horse, then, then, then we'll go down that process and then we'll start looking at... Um, so the other thing that we're doing is sort of, sort of quite a lot of biomechanical type of analysis. And we'll be looking at stride patterns. You're going to have to explain what that means. So that's looking at stride patterns. Right. And then that's the other part. So, so we've, oh, right. got, we've got another graph, got a graphic yeah. up here. So once we start going a bit quicker, we can start looking at, um, we've got stride cadence, which is how many strides a horse takes in a set time frame. So we normally measure that per second. And then we've got the stride length. And we can analyze that data. And it can, again, the cadence is 
in most cases, again, and, it, and, and it's, it's a bit like the genome, it, it works in a lot of cases, but not all cases. The cadence is, is very typical for a sprinter, is a high turnover, um, lots of steps per second, and a stayer is fewer steps per second, but typically longer. Right. And then there's some correlations between stride length and ability. And so we can start looking at that. And again, if you've got a CC with a very high turnover, um, you know, that's all kind of locked into sprinter. And if you've got a TT with a, on your genetic test with a, a sort of longer turnover, then, you know, you've got stayer. But, you know, sometimes you can get it sort of crossways and, and then you have to start really working on the horse and what wins out, the biomechanics or the genetics. Or, and there's probably various factors that come in. So that's where the data can get a little bit, muddle it. And again, then you're going back to your where you've got to interpret riders it. and your interpretation yeah. and, 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 and taking all of the information. And but, d does, would you do this with a horse, whether it came to you as a yearling or it came to you at five or six years old or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, as, as a yearling, you've got to get it to the point where it can go fast before you can yeah. start doing the biomechanical. You know, the, the first part is, is teaching the horse to be a racehorse. But presumably it helps you know what, what to do in order to, to achieve that. Yeah, and then, but with the older horses, really, and we've been quite successful taking older horses, and we had a filly last year that came to us that, you know, she was rated 60, and a, she was a four-year-old, hadn't ever won a race, and she won three races and progressed 20 pounds, you know, and that was basically by increasing the distance... Um, her biomechanical data was sort so of... So increasing the distance in terms of... So we increased the distance that she was running over. Right. So you're using the, you were using this data. Yeah. Obviously, the people who had the horse before had analysed and tried to do this, that, yeah, the other. Yeah, and, you know, and they you... weren't far out, but by taking the genetic test, and with her it was the genetic test more than the stride data, the genetic test said, this horse will stay further. The stride data... You know, she'd run over seven furlongs, and by stepping her up to a mile, we got the the difference. Yeah. But the stride data was possibly questionable whether she would. And actually, by going a mile, then we started seeing her races. Actually, her stride pattern slowly changed to being suitable for that. And we, you can also look at stride data and. Choose but you can't know this when the if the horse is at sales, you can't know. No. That, so well, you can look so at the you, past performances. Yeah. But, so, but you're, there's an element of just yeah. doing what everyone else is doing is yeah. just trying to select ones yeah. that you like. And, and what you're looking at, ones that you like, um, and with older horses, you know, is there something in that form somewhere that actually shows, shows ability? I right. mean, uh, Percy's lab that won at Nottingham, I mean, you know, he was group placed as a two-year-old. So yeah. He clearly had talent. Yeah. It was then just working out what went wrong as a three-year-old and, and what can we change. And, and with him, a lot of it was... So more, what happened with, with Percy's uh, So, Percy's I mean, lab. with him, a lot of it was he was obviously quite keen in his races and he was a slightly you know he'd look not the most straightforward ride and with him there was a lot about our team of riders at home riding him very consistently and we've you know we've got some very good experienced riders and that and, and with them that's really the horsemanship side of it coming in we did a genetic test and we looked at um, his stride patterns and you know he tried a variety of trips last year this, this is him here yeah this is him here winning at, at Nottingham on um, on the uh, or Friday. Friday night, and um, you know he's done this quite comfortably. This is there were a couple of fancied horses here in this handicap, and you know. so when when you saw that was entered in the horses in training sale, you you've gone through the catalogue as everyone does, yeah. and you've just thought, oh look at what he once was capable yeah. of, what he was once capable, and, and can, can we, we get him back? Can to that? we get him back? And you know, he'd only he, I mean, he ran five times last year. He was quite lightly raced, right. and you know, he'd only run three times after being gelded. And he'd shown bits of promise, but he'd run over seven furlongs, a mile, and eleven furlongs, and, and you know, sort of probably only one of those was really the yeah. his optimum trip. So he hadn't really, you know, and so there was enough there to think, okay, and you know, he looked sound and straightforward, and you know, by getting him home, working out what the right trip is, and you know, hopefully, he's, you know, he's an exciting for thirty thousand. We've we've managed to source a horse for his owner, Alan, you know, who's hopefully going to take him to Royal Ascot and, you know... The dream is the, on. The, the dream is on, exactly, on. and that's what yeah. it's about. And, you know, particularly, you know, most of the horses that we have wouldn't be, wouldn't be hugely expensive. Mm. And, and, you know, you're, you're always looking for those good ones to take you to the next level. And, you know, we're quite ambitious. We want to be racing at your Ascots and your Chesters. And, and uh, t tell me about x-rays. So um, x-raying of... Um, so is it the knee in particular? Yeah, so what we do a lot of... Um, and this is, this is with the two-year-olds now, the, the yearlings, is once they've got to a certain point in their training and you're trying to decide, do we go faster or not, you're looking at their physical maturity 
and you, as a horseman, you can look at things and you can s s see the see, see see oh that looks obviously immature, that looks immature, but skeletally, not every horse is mature. And just because a horse is doing something very easily doesn't mean it's actually physically that mature. You know, it's probably quite a talented horse, and by training it too hard at that point, um, you could be causing long term you risk doing that r risk injury. So so we, uh, we'd call it biobanding. And again, you're looking at the genetic results. Is this? That's my new word of the week, biobanding. Yeah, I yeah. never really heard that word. Uh, before. It's a big it's a big buzzword in in um, in football at the moment. And and interestingly, when we did a couple of social media posts earlier in the year about what we're doing, and a, and a guy at Bath University called Professor Sean Cummings sort of reached out to me, and we had a really interesting conversation. And he said, "This is what." A lot of these football academies are doing, and it's that thing of uh, Harry Kane's a really example. He he got cut from, I think Arsenal from Arsenal, didn't he? And then ended up they thought Tottenham. he was too too. You know, he wasn't going to be very big and all the rest of it. And it turned out, you know, he's a great big six foot two centre forward. But and, and it, you know, he was just immature compared to his age group. Right. And actually, once he'd matured up, he was a really you know talented player. Yeah. So in football, particularly, they're moving to to training them in. Rather than going, okay, well, these are the ten-year-olds, these are the fifteen-year-olds. They're looking at their their biological maturity because everyone obviously matures at different rates. And by putting them in into the similar biological maturity and bringing them along, and it's not just about missing players. They've reduced the injuries that they're seeing in these kids. Right. Uh, like I think I think the stat he gave was like in, in one of the studies was seventy-two percent by taking on this approach. Well, if we can bring that to training, and we're having less injuries. And our owners are having less injuries. They're getting more days at the races. They're getting horses that can race for longer. They can win more often. And I dare say the sceptics about the sport as well, if they can see that, yeah. that um, you know, from a welfare point of view, this could have, could have implications. Well, it's got huge ramifications. Anything we can do as, as, as trainers to reduce injury and, you know, most serious injuries are the result of a, a minor injury progressing Mm. To, a big, to a bigger stage. So, so everything we can do from day one to, to reduce that is huge. And we'd work very closely with our vets. Um, you know, our vets will come every Friday and we'll look at every single horse in the yard together as a team. And quite often our farrier will be there and we'll discuss things and we'll look at, you know, and, and if, if that vet's seeing that horse every week when something's unusual, because we're looking for, you know... A, a very lame horse is very obvious, yeah. but, but but there's very subtle subtle changes, yeah. and if we're monitoring that and managing that, and that's what you know, we are pushing all athletes quite hard. You know, just as in human sport, and mm. and, and there's an element of there's a very small amount of injury and and, and and niggle that you know all athletes can put up with, but we have to be very careful that we don't go too far, and so we're 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 trying to be absolutely making sure that we're not you know, and hopefully by that we're we're avoiding you know, serious injuries and, and we, we're producing horses that, you know, even if they're of limited talent, you mm. know, ultimately not every horse can be a champion. They, they yeah. can go on and have a life Absolutely. doing something else mm. and, and is worthwhile. What's um, sometimes the response to data from, from your peers is a bit sneery, a bit sceptical, a bit... What, what, when, when you, I think it's because... When, you, when yeah. you meet your friends and you meet people at the races or at the sales... What are people uh, no, saying? I think more and more people, you know, everyone's looking for an edge and, and there's, you know, there's so many different ways you can find an edge. And I, I, I think, you know, lots of what we're doing, other people are doing bits of it, some of it, more of it, less of it. But um, I think, you know, the response is, you know, people are interested, you know, everyone's competitive, everyone's mm. looking for things, you know, Jim Bald is probably, you know, probably one of the more senior trainers, should we say, and, and you know, yeah. he's developed well, like you'd have thought if, if he's not sceptical, then that is... Exactly, uh, you know, yeah. and I, I think, you know, all trainers who, who want to reach the top are looking for anything that might mm. might help them, and, and if people don't understand things, then, you know, they've got... Quite, and I think sometimes when people are sneery and sceptical about things, it's because they're, they're not prepared to adapt and change, and... And, and more know. and more people are talking about data in yeah. more and more different ways. Well, you know... Uh, Lots of people walk around with a heart rate monitor on on their watch all the time yeah. now, you know. So, so you know, ten years ago when we very first started training and we had to sort of cobble together heart rate monitors um, that were an adapted human version, um, you know, it's quite complicated. Now you can, you know, you can go on websites and you can buy a specialist unit for a thing, and we can produce some of the data that you've put up there. You know, at home on the gallops, we we can collect heart rates, stride data. Um, and we start to put up a, you know, quite an interesting picture. We can look at heart rate recoveries, for example, on horses. How fit are they? How talented are they? Mm. 
you know, there's there's so many applications for it. Yeah, and your your enthusiasm for it is really really striking. I know. What's your um, Twitter handle? Uh, Kubler Racing. At is Kubler it? Racing. At yeah. Kubler Racing. Mm. And there's all sorts of interesting. Yeah, stuff. we try. And, uh, partic- I mean, th- now we're in the season and we're in the middle yeah. of it. It, it. We, we, you know, there's there's possibly it's more about the racing and the runners. But but certainly when we have a quiet patch, we try and just share a bit and put some information out and and you know hopefully people can see that. Um, you know, there's quite a lot going into training horses, and and it's it's not quite as simple as maybe. And it's another uh, really interesting string to to your particular yeah. bow. Yeah, exactly. And you know, hopefully, it's giving us an edge and getting some great results. And you know, um, well, Percy's lab was good, yeah. um, uh, and um, uh, the, the the winner outgate at uh, Chester as well. Have you got anything for York this week? Uh, quiet week this week, right? Um, but um, you know, I mean, we're looking forward. I mean, I think this year we'll have we'll probably have three runners at Royal Ascot, and you know, mm. that's. You know, and you had a nice runner, building. Don't Tell Claire, ran perfectly well at Ascot. Yeah, yesterday. exactly. And, and she, she, you know, she's been trained very much. You know, she's a five-year-old filly that's still progressing. I think Timeform still gave her her highest rating that she's had. Um, she won a very nice handicap at Ascot last season. And the whole pro season this season is targeting her at the Kensington Palace at Royal Ascot. Well, look, um, do tell Claire, your wife Claire, <laughs> uh, that, uh, that you've been here today. Sorry she couldn't be with us as well. Best wishes to Claire. And um, thanks very much indeed for joining us at... Daniel Kubler Racing, is it called? Or at, Kubler at, Racing. Kubler Racing. at Kubler Racing. At Kubler Racing. It's, uh, it's one of those things, it's a bit like getting an old form book and you go through the pages, you go scroll up on the... Or go to the website. The, on the, uh, the Kubler Racing Twitter or indeed its website and there's lots of fascinating stuff on there. Right, we're going to take a break, say goodbye to Daniel. Uh, we'll take a break now and Bob Buckler will be with us very shortly on Luck on Sunday on RTV.